Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Sebastian here. And this video, I'm going to talk about my experience with the Apple ecosystem, my opinions on it. And I'm also going to talk about a general guideline when it comes to buying Apple products, such as an iPhone, iPad, or MacBook, a few things to look for but before you decide to purchase one of these products. And this could be applied to Android and Windows as well, but specifically, I'm going to be talking about Apple products. So in terms of the Apple devices that I own, I own an iPhone 10R, I own a 2017 12.9 inch iPad Pro, I earn, not I earn, I owe, I own a 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro. I have a pair of AirPod Pros and an Apple Pencil first gen. And why do I say all this? I say all this to say that the products that I just mentioned, iPhone, iPad, MacBook, AirPods, Apple Pencil, things of that nature, those are the products that a lot of Apple users have. 99.999% of people that own an Apple product have an iPhone, myself included. That's the core of the Apple ecosystem. And then you got some that own an iPad and a MacBook or one or the other. A lot of users have AirPods and then iPad users, they have the Apple Pencil. And then there's the Apple Watch, which I don't own myself. It's that, that device is kind of like more of a want per se and not much of a need. But yeah, so my experience with the Apple ecosystem over the years, all those Apple devices I mentioned, especially my iPhone and my iPad that I've had for a few years, they have worked pretty well. Performance has been solid for the most part. And whenever I airdrop between my MacBook, iPhone and iPad, it is seamless, which is a benefit to the Apple ecosystem. Another benefit is being able to effortlessly connect my AirPods Pro to my various Apple devices without having to go to Bluetooth settings and pairing it to different devices, unlike if you had third-party headphones, for example, Sony's, Bose's, or any third-party companies, mm. earbuds, over-the-ear headphones, and so on and so forth. So my experience, what benefits have I gained with the Apple ecosystem that has been built over the last few years? I've had products that work really well together so for example, the MacBook and the iPad, being able to use Sidecar has been nice having multiple screens without needing a monitor. Now, sometimes it is a little bit buggy. It's a little slow on the iPad and inconsistent, but when it works good, it really works good. And it's super convenient to have a second screen without being tied to a monitor or a TV. And then anytime I take a screenshot on my MacBook to take notes for a class or something, I take a picture on the MacBook and then airdrop to either my phone if I need to send it to somebody or to my iPad. So that way I can have another screen to look at. So I don't have to constantly scroll on my MacBook to look for it or the monitor that I have it connected to that is in front of me. So having airdrop is a really nice feature to easily transfer pictures and files from device to device. So with those benefits, there are some cons, there are some trade-offs. And the first one is that with the Apple ecosystem, once you're invested in the Apple ecosystem, say you have the iPhone, Apple Watch, AirPods, iPad, or MacBook, or whatever, and so on and so forth, it becomes a walled garden. It becomes very hard for a customer to, ha to have another device. So let's say, for example, you have an iPhone, iPad, and AirPods, and you're looking for a computer that you can easily transfer files from your phone to your iPad to your computer. If you were to get a Windows computer, you can't do that because it's a Windows computer. It doesn't have the same <clears throat> functionality for transferring files from your iPhone and your iPad to the computer, unlike with a MacBook or a Mac product in general. So then if you try to mix in other main primary devices, such as a tablet, laptop, or phone from another brand, 
then the convenience tends to stop right there because they're not made by the same company. So they don't work as well together. They work separately just fine. But in terms of trying to use them together at the same time, it's a little bit tricky. However, with that walled garden, you know, the Apple ecosystem is not free. It is very expensive. And that's part of the reason why Apple charges a lot of money for their products, such as their iPhones, AirPods, iPads, and MacBooks. Depending on how much you want to get out of those devices, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So let's say you want to get an iPhone 13 for $800. That's 800 bucks right there. You want AirPods Pro, that's 250 unless you get them on sale. So that's already over $1,000 just to get a phone and a pair of earbuds. But then let's say you want a MacBook, that's going to run you at least $1,000 if you want the baseline MacBook Air and the prices go up from there. And you can quickly see that even if you get those three devices, for example, or even regular AirPods for 160 or 200 that once you start buying a couple of devices, especially the iPhones or the MacBooks, the prices do tend to go up like crazy pretty damn fast. And the iPads can contribute to that as well, but iPads usually are way more affordable on the lower end, and there's more options from the $400 to $700 range versus with the iPhones nowadays that Apple sells. The cheapest you can get is the SC for $400 bucks with an outdated design, but if you want the more modern notch design, that's going to run you at least $700 if you want the iPhone 13s. And if you want the 11, that's going to run you about 500 unless you get it used somewhere else. The prices do tend to go up a lot when you're investing into the Apple ecosystem. And depending on who you ask with the walled garden approach, some customers love it because Apple products work well on their own and they work well together. So they feel like I shouldn't be getting any tech products from any other brand. I should only be getting Apple stuff. Oh, you want you all you want a speaker? Oh, get the home pod. Oh, you want some headphones? Get the AirPods or Beats. Oh, you want a pencil or a pen for your iPad? Okay, Apple Pencil. You want a mouse? Magic Mouse and so on and so forth. You want a keyboard, you want a trackpad, you want da 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 fill in the blank. Apple seems to have a little bit of everything, but it comes at a high price, which is the con of the ecosystem. This stuff is not cheap. Apple is a trillion dollar company for a reason. So if you do plan on getting deeper into the Apple ecosystem, say you have an iPhone and you want to use more Apple products, realize that it's going to come with a hefty price tag and ask yourself if what you're going to do with your new Apple device to work with your iPhone justifies the price that Apple charges because Apple doesn't care how much you use their products. They're still going to charge the same price regardless. You can get a $1,500 computer, use it for 10 years, and you would say, oh yeah, I got my money's worth. $1,500, I had enough storage, this and that. It stood the test of time. But then somebody else could buy that same $1,500 computer and they use it for two, three years. And they're like, uh, it doesn't quite do enough for me. I paid $1,500 for this and it doesn't quite meet my needs as much as I thought. So uh, it's a waste of money. See, the difference isn't how much those two customers paid. It's the utility that they got out of that $1,500 computer. One customer got 10 years in this hypothetical example, while the other one only got two to three before they, before they believed that, man, I need to upgrade or I need to get a computer from somebody else that's more affordable that I can afford to use for two to three years and not have buyer's remorse. That is the downside when it comes to the Apple ecosystem is that it is very hard to leave in case you're trying to leave the ecosystem and you, know, you can make your own decisions and it is very, very expensive. So when it comes to the ecosystem, if you want to invest into it, it'd be best to have money set aside out of your check-ins account so that you don't have to use your rent money just to get into the ecosystem. That's not smart. Or if you get Apple products, say periodically every few months or every year or so, and slowly add to the ecosystem, that's a smarter route because you're allocating your resources to build up your ecosystem over time, depending on how much 
extra cash on the side you have for the Apple ecosystem that you don't have to use for anything else, especially your bills. So in my opinion, is the Apple ecosystem worth investing to? If you like, the, if you like Apple's products, such as the iPhone, AirPods, iPad, MacBook, etc., and you are curious about how well these products work together, and you have enough cash laying around to afford it, then I would say, yes, it is worth getting into the ecosystem. And in my personal opinion, in my experience, iPhone, that's the core of the Apple ecosystem. Without that, the ecosystem does not exist at all. And then if you want a bigger tablet, you want a tablet with mobile apps, and you want something that's great for watching movies and touchscreen with a big screen, then it's the iPad. Then if you want a computer that's sleek, slim, powerful, this and that, you got the MacBook and you know, these products aren't without their flaws and other YouTubers have gone into those in great detail. So I don't really need to say anything because it's nothing new, but the point is depending on what you're looking for in a device, Apple has something that might appeal to you. You want some earbuds that easily connect to your Apple devices, such as your phone, AirPods, or you want a pencil that you can use to draw on your iPad, Apple Pencil. If you have the iPads with the lightning port, then it's the first gen. But if you have an iPad with type C, it's gen two. And there's some differences. And again, you can watch videos on that. But the point is depending on what you're looking for in a device and what kind of device you need, Apple does have something to offer. So in my opinion, the iPhone, that is the core of the ecosystem. Without that, the entire ecosystem to me falls apart. That's the core of the ecosystem. The Apple Watch doesn't work without it. AirPods, sure, you can use it with your iPad and your MacBook, but then what if you want to easily connect your AirPods to your phone while you're out? Well, having an iPhone makes that a lot easier. And it's not to say that you can't use AirPods in an Android phone. Sure you can because they're Bluetooth headphones, but you're not going to be able to connect them as seamlessly on Android compared to an iPhone because then you'd have to go to the Bluetooth settings and pair them up just like any other pair of headphones versus on the iOS side on your iPhone, for example, you just take them out the case, put them in your ears and just like that, they're connected just like that. And if you're listening to something on, say your MacBook, it switches seamlessly without having to go to Bluetooth settings, hit that and be like, okay, I want to connect this. You don't have to do that with the AirPods when it comes to Apple devices. So now the next thing I'm going to talk about is, you know, in my experience, in my opinion, like the general things I look for in a new device before I decide to get one or have someone get me one. And there's four questions I look for, say, if I already have an Apple device on hand, like an iPhone, iPad, whatever, I would say, all right, is there enough storage on there for me to use it within the next year or so? If the answer is yes, that gives me a reason to hold on. Is my Apple device still getting updates to this day where I can use the latest software? And generally, Apple is really good at keeping their device supported for as long as possible. The iPhone 6S, which came out in 2015, six years ago, gets iOS 15 to this day. So if you have an iPhone 7, 8, 10, 11, any of those devices, you're going to be supported for a little bit or a little while. You know what I mean? So in terms of getting the latest software on your phone, if you have an iPhone 6S or newer, which most iPhone users have, you don't have to worry about updates. So that's not really a big deal. But if you have an old Apple device, like an iPhone 6 or an old iPad, old MacBook from whatever year, then not having the latest software is a little bit frustrating. But most Apple users don't generally have this problem. So does your device support the latest software? And the answer is probably yes. That's another reason to hold on to it. And then third thing is What's the performance like? Is it still fast and snappy just like you got it yesterday? Or at least it's 80 to 90% as snappy as it was when you got it, say, three years ago? If the answer is yes, that's another 
And that's another point to consider. Okay, maybe I should hold on a little bit longer if it still performs. You know what I mean? So again, I'd say storage, software updates, performance. And then the last thing is the condition of the device. Is my device in good condition? Is it in usable condition? Does it have a lot of cracks? Does it have a lot of scratches? Is it all beaten up where I feel like I either need to upgrade it or get it fixed for a large fee? Unless you get Apple Care Plus, which lasts you two years. But anyway, is your device in usable condition where you can still use your device like your phone, iPad, MacBook, whatever? If the answer is yes, that's another reason to hold on. Now, despite that, I'm not saying that, okay, it's supported still. It still gets, a, you still have storage, right? Performance is fine. It's in good condition. With, those, with that being said, that I'm not saying, okay, if your device currently covers those four areas, hold on to it. I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying those are some factors you should consider before you drop a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars and get a new Apple device. And if one of those four criteria is not met, if you're out of software updates or say, I don't know, your performance is slow. If your performance is slow, maybe you might need to get your device fixed, but if you've had it for a few years and it has aged and it's starting to show its age and its performance has dropped, then it's like, okay, I've had this for a while, performance has dropped off the last year or so, I've had it for a while. You know what? I feel like I got my money's worth. I'm gonna upgrade. Hey, you do you. But then let's say, okay, well, I got the storage, I got the updates, performance is fine, and it's in good condition, but I really like that new color, but I really like those cameras. I really like the power on the new MacBook or the new iPads. Okay, if that's you, then you got to consider, okay, are the cameras on the new iPhones, the iPhone 13s or whatever phone you're trying to get, are those cameras or those newer features on the new phone that you want? Does that justify the price to pay in order to get that? And it's up to you. Like, think about it. Say you have an iPhone 10 and you're thinking of getting the 13 Pro. Sure, the iPhone 10 still works fine, still gets updates, but the 13 Pro has much better cameras, much better battery life. And those are the main selling points and other small differences here and there. that you can watch tech videos on but those are the main real world advantages that the 13 Pro, for example, has over the 10 and the 10S. And, you know, tech YouTubers, they can go into all these different specs in here and there and blah, blah, blah. But generally, when it comes to a phone, customers care about a few things. They care about battery life. Can they use their phone for a little while before it runs dead or they need to charge it? Are the cameras good, especially for you selfie kings and queens out there that take a lot of selfies? I would take some selfies here and there, blah, blah, blah. For you selfie kings and queens out there, or those of you that use your phone a lot for photography, are the cameras good enough for your selfies or for your photography? That's another major factor that a lot of customers care about. They also care about the ease of use. Is the device easy to use? Is it so easy to use that your parents or your grandparents can use it and they can understand how to use it. You know what I mean? Is it convenient? Is it gonna get supported for a while? Things like that, that's what customers care about the most. Customers, the average customer doesn't really care too much about what ports are on the phone, say Lightning or USB-C. Most average customers that aren't into tech like that don't really care. They don't notice that. It's like, hmm. I could charge my phone still, whatever. Like, they don't really care. They could use their phone like, hey, they don't really care too much about that. Or say 120 hertz refresh rate. If 60 hertz has worked fine for them for years and they're used to it and they don't have a problem, then unless they try out 120 hertz and see the difference, most customers are going to be like, eh, I don't really care about that. I'm not going to pay $1,000 plus for 120 Hertz, because I just don't care enough about it. And I don't think that's enough of a reason to pay $1,000 to get that feature, right? Customers normally don't care about that. They care about the cameras, the battery life, the performance, 
the support that it gets, and the ease of use. Generally, customers care about those five things when it comes to an iPhone. And then what about an iPad? Same thing, performance, cameras, although not as much as iPhones. The power, like, is it powerful enough to replace your laptop? And there's been a lot of discussion over the last few years on whether or not an iPad is good enough to be a laptop replacement. In my opinion, on its own, not quite. However, if you do get a keyboard and a mouse, then you might be thinking, you know, depending on what programs you use, say you're drawing or you're taking notes or you're using it for school. You know, my experience using the iPad as my main computer for school for a few years as my main computer, I've gotten by just fine with that. So for some, depending on what they need it for, it might be good enough to replace a laptop. Not to mention iPads are generally much lighter compared to laptops because there's no keyboard attached. There's no trackpad on an iPad. It's way lighter. It's got a big screen. It's got touch screen, which most customers are used to from the iPhone. So that's also another reason why customers, when they get a MacBook, but they're used to the iPhone and they try to touch their screen like this, they're like, wait a minute, this don't have touch screen, but my phone has it. So why doesn't my computer have it? You know what I mean? That, that's another factor. Now for me, that's not a big deal, but I could see some customers getting upset about that. Then when it comes to a MacBook, is the, perform, is the performance good? Battery, is the battery life good? Good. What kind of programs can I run on there? And among other questions that you have to ask yourself before purchasing an Apple product, let alone getting yourself into the Apple ecosystem. And if you feel like that your product, so your phone, iPad, MacBook, whatever, whatever you have that's Apple related or Android or Windows, if you feel like that's doing the job right now and it's doing just fine and you're kind of strapped short for cash, then it's probably a good idea to hold on to that device until you find something that you want and you can afford to go into your emergency funds or your savings in order to purchase that new phone, that new iPad, new computer. And remember, you don't wanna use your rent or your mortgage money to get a MacBook. That's not smart. Those bills need to be paid, you know what I'm saying? But you don't need to be getting a new MacBook or a new phone or blah, blah, blah every month. But that rent and that mortgage is going to be due, believe that. So use, so set aside some money so that you can purchase these products because they are really expensive and they will eat into your wallet depending on what you get when it comes to Apple products especially with the ecosystem. But from my experience, once you're in the ecosystem and you have multiple Apple products that work really well together, whether it's an iPhone, AirPods, Apple Watch, iPad, MacBook, whatever combination ecosystem you have, once you have multiple Apple products, it is really, really hard to step out. For example, my sister's got a phone, AirPods, Apple Watch, MacBook, iPad. Now, the iPad shouldn't really use that much, but still, she has a lot of Apple devices. My dad and my mom, iPhone, AirPods, iPad. My brother has all that, plus a MacBook, and he has an Apple Watch. So all of us throughout the family, we have multiple different Apple products, some that we use every single day and that we rely on, and some that we use occasionally from time to time. So if you're going to get into the Apple ecosystem and you have maybe one or two Apple products, make sure that you've saved, make sure that you set aside some money, put it into a savings account, maybe like an Apple savings account or, or something so that when you're ready to buy a new Apple product, you don't have to use your rent money or your check-ins account to get new Apple products and break your back. You know what I mean? So that's going to be it. It's probably gone on for like 30 to 40 minutes or so, but I'm going to wrap this up. I will take off and I'll see y'all in the next one. Peace out.